Welcome, and uh, thank you for coming to our bi-weekly uh, series, uh, our webinar series called Sight and Sound Bites from the Eye and Ear Foundation. Uh, we've been doing these uh, bi-weekly lunchtime webinar series of the research and clinical innovations at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine uh, now since April. And uh, again, thank you for coming today. And today's topic is one that we're all very excited about. It's on optic nerve regeneration, uh, progress and future directions uh, that are part of the Lewis J. Fox Center for Vision Restoration. Uh, I'm Lawton Snyder, I'm the, uh, the CEO of the INEAR Foundation. The INEAR Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck. We work closely with the two world-renowned departments of ophthalmology and otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide uh, to, from the Eye and Ear Foundation to, to support research are only made possible because of philanthropic support. And, uh, and we do appreciate uh, um, certainly that many of you have done so and, and, um, and are interested in doing so. So uh, before we start today's program, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, this is a webinar program through Zoom. And because many of you know what you have been on Zoom frequently in, as in the last few months, um, some things are the same, some things are a little different. You'll see there is a chat button in the bottom, but that is disabled. So we are working specifically, if you have questions and answers, to use the Q&A function. It's called, it's at the bottom, there's a little bubble, you click on it, and what you can do is you can type questions. We encourage you to type questions throughout the program. We'll hold all questions to the end and I'll read those questions. I'll ask that people refrain from uh, asking personal health questions. We, we actually will skip those and we won't read those. But if you do have questions that you'd like to ask of our clinical teams here at, at the University of Pittsburgh, you can do so by sending an email to uh, Mr. Craig Smith, who is uh, in, in the invitation that you received. Tomorrow, you'll receive a survey via email to provide us with feedback, and you'll also be added to our email list to receive future webinars. I want to thank, thank our uh, distinguished professor and chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology, Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel, who is going to be the moderator, moderator for today's program and introducing uh, the program to all of you. Um, I, Dr. Sahel, I, I know, has uh, when he came to Pittsburgh four years ago, the Fox Center and the opportunity to grow our research in optic nerve regeneration was, was very important to him and a priority. I also know he is deeply committed to making Pittsburgh the leading research center in the world for groundbreaking, transformative, and translational technologies to restore vision. And it's his leadership and knowledge and skills that are already leading us in that direction. Dr. Sahel, uh, thank you and, and, uh, and, and uh, please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are very excited to share today some of the progress that has been accomplished in the field of uh, optic nerve regeneration. This has been the focus of the Fox Center. The first person I met from Pittsburgh is Louis Fox uh, four years ago, four years and a half, that led me to come here. And uh, we have been focusing with Jeff Gross, the Vice Chair for Research and Director of the Fox Center, about uh, this topic. And we have been able to recruit uh, top faculty, also collaborate with a very good faculty at Pitt, as you will hear from Steel Badilac. And we are very happy to share all the programs and the perspective we are working on. So I'll start with a brief introduction about why it is so important. The optic nerve is a connection between the eye and the brain. You can have a perfectly functioning eye, but if your ganglion cells, the cells that are forming the optic nerve, or if the optic nerve is damaged, there is no image that is reaching the brain. The brain is the real place where we see the images are being sent to the brain, actually processed before they are sent, and the brain is really where we see. So if you cannot connect the two, there is no vision that is possible. On the next slide, as you will see, everything is starting at the level of the retina. The light is being captured in the depth of the retina, which you see in blue and green are the photoreceptors that are capturing the light. They are transforming the, the energy from the light into electrical signal that is being processed in the retina. The retina is processing all both temporal and spatial contrast, a lot of information. And then this is reaching the ganglion cells, which are in brown at the bottom of the slide. And uh, these ganglion cells, about uh, 1.2, 1.5 million, are formed the optic nerve and the optic nerve is then connecting directly to the brain. 
So the ganglion cells are receiving a signal that already contains about information about the shape, the direction, the movement, the time, the color, and all of this is processed in the retina, and this is a continuous processing that continues up to the brain. So we are going to focus today on the optic nerve, but we have to remember that the optic nerve is formed by cells that are lying in the retina, and is a very long connection from the retina to the brain. Next slide. What we'll focus today is how you can regrow the optic nerve. Uh, in contrast to other species, and Jeff Gross is an expert in that, we cannot, as mammalians, spontaneously regrow an optic nerve, and we have to understand why and how to cope with that. But regrowing the optic nerve is one thing. The other thing is how to connect it to the right place, because there is a very complex uh, pathway from the eye to the brain. Some fibers are crossing the midline, some are staying on the same side, and we have a very accurate projection from the image into the brain, what we call retinotopia, which means that there is a map of the image that is formed on the brain. So the connectivity is, is one thing, but the quality of the connectivity and the accuracy of the connectivity is very important too. So any work on regenerating the optic nerve has to cope with the quantity and the quality of reconnection. Next slide. Why is this so much of an issue? It's because many people are suffering from optic nerve damage. The main condition leading to the loss of optic nerve connectivity is glaucoma. This is one of the most frequent diseases in the world. Unfortunately, many of these uh, blindness uh, could be avoided because the, the glaucoma is a treatable disease if it is taken care of early enough with appropriate therapy but half of the patients are not diagnosed and half the patient don't have the right treatment or don't follow the right treatment regimen. And when the pressure in the eye is expanding, as you can see on the bottom part of the slide, what you, uh, what you have is a compression of the blood flow into the optic nerve and mechanical damage to the optic nerve. So the pressure in the eye is a risk factor that is leading to compression and damage to the ganglion cells and the optic nerve. The estimate is that there are close to 100 million people affected already. We don't know actually the exact numbers because half of the people are not even diagnosed. So this is a real pandemic and there is nothing that really would uh, eliminate that unless we are able to treat early enough and appropriately enough. But once this has occurred, that the optic nerve has been damaged, that we can regrow the optic nerve. There are many other conditions that can lead to loss of the optic nerve, for example, tumors or genetic disease, but the other main provider is injury. Any type of injury can put the optic nerve at risk because it's going through a very small channel in the bone at the, at the, at the end of your orbit, which is uh, where the eye is being lodged. And this is uh, this uh, fracture at the level of this uh, channel, because the optical channel is leading to damage to the optic nerve and facial fracture uh, are connected to ocular injuries in 67% of cases. And there are several instances where over a few, a few hours, actually, the optic nerve can be irreversibly damaged. So we have therapies, uh, surgeries that can be performed. We have a wonderful team here doing this type of emergent surgery. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary team. But uh, once this has occurred, the only approach is really to be able to regenerate the optic nerve. And this is the big challenge. This is probably one of the most, if not the most, important challenge to ophthalmology currently. This is why the Fox Center is so important. It's really trying to tackle a major issue and be at the cutting edge. So what we are going to hear from uh, Jeff Gross in a short minute is how we structure the Fox Center with the support of Louis Fox and donors, including anonymous donors. But this is how we have been able to really gather a very good team, an outstanding team, and trying to develop this type of research that is very promising. So I'll hand over to Jeff Gross to present what the the Fox Center is about. Next slide, Jeff. Okay, there we go. So uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the work we're doing at the Fox Center. Um, as Dr. Sahel mentioned, this is a, a critically important problem to really understand how these ganglion cells function and how they're built such that we can try to regenerate them once they're lost to injury. And, you know, this is a major, major problem in neuroscience, uh, uh, axon regeneration. And we've sort of, I think, in an innovative and, and quite unique way in the world started to tackle this. And that is by forming the Lewis J. Fox Center for Vision Restoration. Um, so this is a, a 
grouping between the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, and the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and formed a bit over 10 years ago, really is the first comprehensive program dedicated to this type of regenerative ophthalmology and looking at the optic nerve specifically and trying to develop innovative ways to restore the optic nerve and regenerate the optic nerve. So the Fox Center is uh, built upon Lewis and Darthy as our founders and supporters. Um, I serve as a scientific director. And through this support and philanthropy, we've really been able to build a terrific team of scientists within the Department of Ophthalmology. So we have Taka Kuajima, who's an expert on optic nerve regeneration. Um, through help of, of Lewis and Darthy and other donors, we were just able to recruit uh, Quinta Chang from Stanford University, who studies stem cells and looks at ganglion cell formation and how we can use that information to repair and restore the optic nerve. We hired someone named Isam Aldiri, who studies the biology of ganglion cells, really understanding how genes are turned on and turned off that enable a ganglion cell to form in case we can develop ways to then use that information to generate new ganglion cells or rebuild the axons that come from those ganglion cells to form the optic nerve. And then we have lots of partnerships. And the one you're gonna hear today is really a terrific partner in Steve Badalak from the Department of Surgery. Um, Steve's really been affiliated with the Fox Center since its inception. And he's an expert in all sorts of therapies, developing particularly extracellular matrix, as he'll tell you, based therapies for, uh, for helping regrow these, these lost axons. So in addition to people at Pitt, we also have a really amazing team of national and international collaborators. This is a photo taken last year where the Fox Center holds a conference, sort of a workshop, a think tank, every year focused on optic nerve regeneration. And this is really the only one of these in the world. And we bring together 20 to 25 experts each year and challenge them to come up with new solutions be it uh, you know, new therapies, new biology, and to build collaborations that we can then hopefully seed with our scientists and others to really develop into, into therapeutic approaches. So again, we have this terrific expertise in the Fox Center at Pittsburgh, but our network casts much, much wider nationally and internationally to these and other experts. And we've also recently partnered with the Glaucoma Research Foundation, who's been terrifically supportive of our programs, um, particularly as, as Dr. Sehel said, as this relates to glaucoma and the need to rebuild that optic nerve. So today what you're gonna hear are stories from three scientists, Dr. Steve Badalak, Taka Kuajima, and Quinta Chang about some of the science that's going on in the Fox Center. Um, and then we're going to hear from Lewis as well at the very end. So first, I want to introduce Steve Badalak, who's going to tell you about his work on matrix-bound vesicles and how this relates to ganglion cell function and regeneration. So, Steve. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, take, you can hear me uh, okay. Is that right? I hope. Yes, you're great. Okay, good. Just checking. Yeah, and, and, and thank you for the invitation, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sahail and uh, uh, Lewis, of course, as well. And what I'm going to do is spend the next 10 to 12 minutes trying to uh, highlight um, some of the work that we conduct, have uh, conducted in our collaboration with the Fox Center. And this is a good example, as Jeff was just saying, of taking some principles that we learn in the McGowan Institute of Regenerative Medicine and applying them directly to appropriate uh, and relevant areas uh, in the eye. And so today I'm going to um, get, spend the first half of this presentation giving you some background on um, some, a, a method of providing important signaling molecules to preserve cell uh, form and function. And these are, we call these matrix-bound nanovesicles. And to give you a little background, uh, if you'd advance it, uh, Jeff. Let's see. Okay, yeah, and this, this um, concept is based on the premise that if we can modulate the uh, innate immune response, basically inflammation, that we can uh, do a lot of good, either in minimizing and mitigating uh, the problems downstream and, and preserving function. And one of the mechanisms are these matrix-bound nanovesicles, and another uh, component of them are the lipid mediators that are part of their capsule. Next slide. And uh, so 
three things, a little bit of background, some difference between what most people would understand as nanovesicles, that is exosomes, and what these matrix-bound uh, extracellular vesicles are, and then the ocular applications to um, finish it off. Next slide. So, so my, my uh, laboratory has, go ahead and hit the next couple slides, Jeff, uh, has focused upon using mammalian extracellular matrix as a biologic inductive scaffold for the restoration of tissues. And we, the, the matrix is present in every single tissue in the body. Uh, it's a combination of structural and functional proteins. And what we've learned over the past 25 years are the way that uh, cell and uh, cell matrix interactions can uh, provide some pretty valuable uh, potentially therapeutic uh, functions. Uh, we can isolate extracellular matrix by taking literally any tissue, decellularizing it and harvesting the matrix. Next slide. The, uh, one of the, the primary, I don't, this slide is not meant to be read. Uh, what it is meant to do is to show that uh, there is now an accepted uh, and robust interest in the immunomodulatory properties of extracellular matrix. One of it, it looks like its main functions is to control inflammation uh, so that it doesn't get out of hand and to maintain an environment so that cells are healthy in every tissue of the body, the eye included. Next slide. So if you look at the matrix in a diagram diagrammatic form, it's loaded with bunches of, a whole bunch of different molecules, structural molecules, uh, functional uh, signaling molecules, uh, and, and how they interact with cells, it, it happens in a variety of ways. There are certain ligands that cells recognize when they touch the matrix. There are growth factors that are released, particularly when the matrix is degraded, like the following an injury or when we supply one of these uh, bioscaffolds. There are structural molecules. The cryptic peptides uh, are generated as the matrix gets degraded so that pieces of a parent molecule become an active peptide only when they're needed during a, a, a degradation process. But most recently, we identified these uh, matrix-bound nano these nanovesicles embedded within it. So it was just amazing. We've been working with this material for 30 years and did not recognize that these were embedded within. In fact, nobody had. And the real question was, well, are they really unique? Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, uh, or are, are they um, just simply an exosome that is trapped within uh, the, the ECM, and I'm going to show you how that's not the case in a, a couple of slides here. But the, the real question was, okay, we identified these extracellular vesicles. Do they have any biologic relevance, and how do they affect cell behavior? So through a series of studies, and I'd be happy to supply anybody that's interested on this slide with uh, um, references and PDFs and so forth, if you just contact either Craig or myself um, at after this presentation and we'll get these to you. But one thing, that the, this bullet point list shows what happens when you take these MBV, as we call them, and expose various cell types to them. They, they, they can change inflammatory cells to anti-inflammatory cells. They can promote differentiation of stem cells. They can recruit cells. They can mitigate uh, the cytokine storm of, uh, that happens during certain inflammatory processes. Next slide. So we uh, then once we first identified them, we said, "Are they really? Pre where? How widespread are they?" And the bottom line is that they're in literally every tissue. We've and we've looked at probably every tissue of the body, and not only in the native tissue, but that top row, Zen Matrix, Matrix Stem, and Biodesign, are examples of three commercially available products that are made from extracellular matrix for different therapeutic applications. And they're present just as robustly in those commercial products as they are. So we've been basically giving patients these uh, for a long time, uh, but didn't know it. And, and there's been more than 10 to 15 million um, patients treated with these uh, types of uh, materials. And the reason I mention it is to say, okay, they're obviously safe. Otherwise, we'd have, had, we'd have known that there's problems there. And they don't elicit any sort of an adverse uh, response, even though many of the matrices that we use are, are xenogeneic porcine in origin. Next slide. So uh, we, wanted to, we wanted to ask that question. Are they really a, a distinct class of extracellular vesicle, or are they just a piece of a broken cell during this, the um, um, decellularization process, or are they an exosome that is trapped within the, the vesicles? And so, next slide, working with 
uh, 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 excellent lipidomics guy. His, his pictures on the next slide uh, is uh, his name is um, Valerian Kagan. What we what we'll, we'll show you is that they certainly are a distinct class. And the the reason I'm going to this, I'm showing you these couple of slides because extracellular vesicles are not new. Anybody that works in this field is aware of the fact that these nano-sized vesicles have potential. They're present in every single body fluid, and there's been intense interest, just as you can see from the statistics there, in trying to apply these extracellular vesicles in, in either diagnostic or therapeutic applications in the, in the eye. The next slide gives you an idea of the different locations in the ocular system where uh, exosomes have been um, studied. Uh, so this is not new in terms of extracellular vesicles, but obviously, uh, if they were the answer to everything, we'd, we'd already have accepted standard of care therapies for them. So uh, the, the question is, why would we want to conduct just one more study with a different extracellular vesicle? The next slide shows you that um, uh, wh how we determined that they can have unique properties. We did an experiment and we took, in which we took different cell types, and one of them was a fibroblast, grew them in culture, um, and then collected the uh, um, media in which the exosomes are secreted. We, we collected the extracellular matrix that was secreted on the bottom of the culture plate, and we collected the cells themselves. And then we isolated, um, in the next slide, what you'll see is we isolated uh, the um, uh, 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 RNA from the vesicles in, in each location. So, and then we did comparisons of, say, the ex liquid phase, which would be the exosomes, to the MBV, and it, it, we characterize their size. Keep going, Jeff. And uh, what you can see is we then look for surface markers. We showed that MBV have different surf surface markers from exosomes. Next slide shows you that they also have got different surface proteins, microRNA, luminal proteins. They are the same cell produces extracellular vesicles that are distinctly different. The next slide, I think, is one, uh, uh, one more to show that there's some of these um, differences. We've got a pie chart up there, for example, of the different types of lipids that form the membrane. So cells make these matrix-bound nanovesicles for a given, for a specific purpose. And that purpose is different than the purpose of, of the vesicles that they secrete into fluid. They sit in the matrix. They, they can reside there for years. And they're not used until the matrix, until they're needed, when the matrix is degraded. And what we have found is that their, their cargo, their intra vesicular cargo is almost exclusively com comprised of signaling molecules that promote reparative uh, events following injury and they're anti-inflammatory. So we applied this in other body systems and said, what would happen if we take these to the eye? Next slide. Uh, yep, so keep, keep going, Jeff. This just shows that, the, that the, some of the studies that we've done, done, and there are publications on this, which I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, in, in, when we applied this to the eye, what we did was a, a, a rat model in which we increased the intraocular pressure to 130 millimeters of mercury uh, for 60 minutes. Obviously, an extreme um, uh, pressure-induced injury, which would effectively cut off blood supply to the retina as well as the pressure itself effects on the uh, on the retinal ganglion cells and other uh, rods and cones that are there. Uh, and then uh, after the injury had occurred, uh, an hour later, we injected uh, a 0.1 micro, uh, uh, one microliter of MBV, the, and the uh, dose is about 10 to the ninth of the MBV into the vitreous, which then entered the, uh, the cells that comprise the retina. And on the next slide, uh, what you'll see is the, uh, uh, an example of the type of injury that's caused. So the markers for the uh, RGC and the optic nerve itself, uh, C, uh, itself at the bottom, um, in the control, got, you've got a very robust population of cells. Hang on one second, Jeff. Uh, and then the um, the optic nerve is, is intact. After the injury, we've lost most of the cells uh, in, in the retina, and the optic nerve uh, axons are obviously markedly damaged as well. The next slide shows that if we inject only saline, basically no difference from the um, uh, injury itself. But if we, in the group that was injected with the MBV in the next slide, 
what you can see is we get, uh, and this is after 14 days, we get to have a remarkable, I mean, almost indistinguishable restoration of the uh, uh, retinal ganglion cells and the optic nerve uh, itself down below. And so the, now the question becomes, have we regenerated or just mitigated the uh, re response and, and preserved, uh, prevented the eventual death of it? Um, and we, so we're in the middle of some of these studies. The next slide uh, shows you that the, the uh, optic nerve at the top there is the control uh, and then the injury uh, uh, is the in the next uh, slide where the uh, red marker uh, for uh, the nerve axons themselves is virtually gone. Same thing in the control in the third panel. And, and what you can see down at, at the low, uh, lowest panel is it's not normal, not quite normal, but there's an, an uh, uh, I, I don't know what the, you can estimate yourself, 70% uh, or 80% of, of axonal integrity compared to the um, uh, normal non-injured control. So we not only have uh, uh, preservation of the retinal cells, but also the axons that derive from those uh, uh, retinal ganglion cells. Next slide. Okay, and, and then to show that they're functional, we do a photopic negative response in which on the panel on the left, the red shows the lack of the response in the saline treated uh, controls uh, and in the, on the right, the restoration of that uh, ability of those cells to respond to light uh, on, on the right. Now this doesn't necessarily say vision, but it does say that we've got an intact neuron so, uh, transmitting the signal. Next slide. So how does this work? And so these are the things we're looking at. One thing we do know for sure is that because in, in, the, in the manuscript where we described this study, we showed that there's a marked uh, trans, transition of the pro-inflammatory astrocyte phenotype to the anti-inflammatory astrocyte and glial phenotype. So we're definitely modulating the immune response. We also believe that a lot of this is mediated through, uh, through lipids that are present on the surface as well as the, uh, of the MBV, as well as the carbo, uh, the microRNA uh, within the uh, lumen. And then, the question is, are we getting any stem and progenitor cell differentiation or are, simp are we simply preserving the ones that were there and preventing them from uh, going all the way to cell death? So lots of interesting questions that we're looking forward to answering uh, with our colleagues at the Fox Center. And uh, I'll, I'll leave you with those questions. And again, uh, we'll be available for some little bit of Q&A at the end, or if anybody wants to uh, contact me separately, you're welcome to. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Taka Kuwajima, who's going to tell us a little bit about his work on optic nerve regeneration. Hi. Um, first of all, I really thank you know, Mr. Fox for generous support uh, for our ongoing uh, research. So my library has been focused on the optic nerve regeneration and the restoration of visual functions after ocular trauma in glaucoma. So here, you appreciate the retinal optic nerve projection from the eye to the brain. However, once optic nerve is damaged in humans and even mouse, retinal ganglion cells die and then these retinal axons cannot regenerate. So the question is that, how can we reconnect the eye to the brain after injury and in glaucoma? So we have to think about three steps. First one is prevent RGG death and promote axon regeneration. Second one, navigate regenerated axons to the right places in the brain. The last one is form long-lasting connections, and then recover visual functions. So my lab is trying to understand the molecular mechanisms to complete these three steps for establishing future treatments. So today I will talk about the you know, first process, how can we prevent RGC death and promote axon regeneration? Next slide, please. So upper panel, you can just see that in the adult central nervous system, axon is already connected to the brain. Around the axon, no neuronal cells exist. For example, oligodendrocyte, astrocyte. And in normal conditions, these no neuronal cells are important for visual functions. However, after optic nerve injury, oligodendrocyte, myelin debris, reactive astrocyte, and glial scar showing the red box exist around degenerating axons. 
actually these non-neural cells promote axon degeneration and inhibit axon regeneration. Next slide, please. So in my lab, to block the inhibitory signals from such a non-neural cells after injury, so we set up the drug screening. So we tested 50 thiodine chemical compounds and then one of the candidate drugs here successfully promoted axon regeneration after optic nerve injury. However, axon regeneration uh, eff efficacy by this drug is still limited. So we just get started to collaborate with Steve to enhance axon regeneration and also RGC protection after injury with MBB. Next slide, please. We also focus on the other cellular aspects around the optic nerve after injury. So blood vessels are attached with the optic nerve. After optic nerve injury, these blood vessels are damaged. And we found that one of the blood proteins binds to the receptor, which is expressed on the optic nerve of RGCs. And these RGCs start to die within the three days after injury. So we have been trying to identify uh, this and other molecular uh, functions and also drugs. And hopefully all of them will be applied to human patients in the near future. So thank you for your attention. And the next speaker is Dr. Kunjin Chan. Thank you, Taka. Thank you for the opportunity for presenting my work today. Here, I want to ask a big question. How can we regenerate the axon after artery nerve injury? So this is the cartoon of the eyes and artery nerve. So you can see the purple one is the retinal ganglion cell that transfer the visual information uh, via the, uh, from the eyes to brain through the extending axons. And in the artery nerve, there are other cells such as atrocyte and the microglia, which is a green color. So in this study, I will focus on the microglia, which are considered to play a bad role in ocular information. So we aim to alleviate the artery nerve information after injury. Next slide. So this is my previous study showing the retinal microglia activation in the retina. So the left panel, this is a normal retina. And the central one is the endotoxin induced uveitis model in mouse, which you can see is brighter and more a green spot with a microglia activation. However, if we treat the animal with the sobonio, as you can see reduce of the uh, uh, microglia, microglia activation. So sobonio is an adult reductase inhibitor, which is known to reduce inflammation and uh, diabetic complication in eyes. And the bottom figure, you can see left one is a resting microglia. And once the microglia under stress, it will secrete some cytokine and will kill the neighboring cell, leading the cell death. So we want to ask, can we alleviate microglia activation under stress like artinef injury? Next slide. So I used the artery nerve crash in animal model to study axon regeneration. So the bottom one is the artery nerve after injury and see how it looks like for a macular activation. So the left bottom panel one, you can see the brighter and the more green spot, which indicate the microglia activation after artery nerve crash. And if we treat the animal with adult reductase inhibitor, sobonia, we can see redu reduce of the uh, activation. And the right side is show you a statistic bar chart. We can see the significant reduction of the IBA1 passive cell in RT nerve. By the way, IBA1 is the marker, biomarker for active uh, microglia. Next slide. So my future direction will be like three directions. First one is to study whether sobonio can attenuate cytokine secretion in RT nerve after crash. And the second one is to investigate whether sobonio can promote axon regeneration. So the right side is example figures of the gene therapy. So you can see the top one is control treatment after arterial crash. We don't see any axon regeneration or barely can see that. But after the gene therapy, we can start to see some uh, axon regeneration in the arterial nerve. This is the, my current study just submitted. And 
our analysis M of direction is to use a combination of pharmacological and a gene therapy together. We hope to use this combination therapy to see a more axon regeneration. So this is pretty much my presentation today. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Steve, and Taka, and Quinta. And I, I neglected to mention, I mean, you know, the Fox Center, I think really we're recruiting the best and the brightest scientists. So we recruited Taka from Columbia University where he worked with Carol Mason and Serge Shaborsky, two experts in optic nerve biology and, and axon regeneration. And then we've recruited Quinta from Jeff Goldberg's lab at Stanford and Jeff's a real expert in glaucoma and stem cell approaches to treat optic diseases. So we're really working to bring in new minds and really creative scientists into the center to tackle this, this overarching question of optic nerve regeneration. Um, so you've heard from a couple of the scientists and next you're gonna hear from Lewis Fox. So Lewis is really the visionary that, that started this center over 10 years ago and approached Pitt and UPMC and, and the McGowan to get this going and has been you know, a benefactor of the center in helping us to recruit new scientists. He's uh, very enthusiastic and, and likes to talk the science with us. Um, his conviction for us pushing the field forward, I mean, it's palpable when you speak to Lewis and you're gonna, you're gonna hear that in a moment that his, his support and his enthusiasm, I think you know, in part come from his appreciation for the science and us uh, pushing it forward, and also the fact that he's a patient. And as, as Lewis will tell you, he's an impatient patient uh, and he wants solutions. And that really drives us forward every day in the work we're doing. Um, so Lewis, please uh, uh, take it away. Jeff, thank you for the introduction. And I wanna thank Jose and Jeff and Taka and Steve and Dr. Chang. Uh, this is my first webinar and uh, just Briefly, as uh, was said <clears throat> 10 years ago, uh, there was a program on television called Sunday Morning, uh, which is a, a bit of a travel program, but that was a special program then because they were talking about uh, medicine and a new field of medicine that I knew nothing about. And in the course of the program, they mentioned that the University of Pittsburgh, which by the way is my alma mater, uh, wanted to develop a regenerative medicine uh, thrust in the field of ophthalmology. So being the typical type A, I called Pitt and got a lot of people excited. And, and But I remember most significantly in the course of the discussions and I guess part negotiations, but discussions were the fact that they were saying, you know, medicine takes time and research takes a lot of time and takes years. And I said, damn it, I'm a patient. I don't have time. I don't want to wait years. I want it now. And I think that's how most patients feel, whether it's with problems with, uh, with the eyes or anything else. So fortunately, uh, Pitt honored me by naming the center, the Fox Center. And over the last several years, uh, we've done a lot of things, particularly um, having Jeff Gross join us and then about a little over three years ago, uh, as I say, there was a very bright star shining in the east. And it wasn't over the little town of Bethlehem. It was over the city of Pittsburgh, where Dr. Jose Alain Sahel uh, was at the time the chief of ophthalmology at the Sorbonne Hospital on the Sorbonne University faculty. But to me, more importantly, had created, originated, developed L'Institut de la Vision where one of the finest research units in the world in ophthalmology, I think they have or approximately 300 people working there in research. So with that bright light, Jose had made some decisions about changing some things in his life. And after being sought after by every major university and health group in the United States, he also saw the light and joined us at the University of Pittsburgh for which I am extremely delighted and proud to have him with us and to make that association. And with Jeff, with uh, Dr. Sahel joining us, he refined the focus of the Fox Center. 
and said, we really need to focus on the severe problem of optic nerve damage. And that is why we're on this program today and where we are. And uh, it's, it's interesting that, as I think Jeff mentioned, the Fox Center is basically a, a stool with three legs, University of Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and the McGowan Institute. Well, our, our plan going forward with the Fox Center is also really based on three legs. The first is the fabulous team that Jeff and Dr. Sahel have created at the University of Pittsburgh. And I guess I should say, I've been told, he's not finished yet. So there are a couple slots open for some bright stars to join us at Pitt. Uh, these researchers are fantastic. You don't need to motivate them. They are self-energized. I think they're all born with a special gene. But the second part of our thrust is, was mentioned briefly, is collaboration. I've always believed in collaboration and I know that, that Jeff and, and Jose recognize we can't do it all ourselves. So collaboration is a critical element, a critical ingredient in achieving the success we want going forward. Uh, I, I can tell you, I think it was almost seven years ago and I think it was the third International Symposium of the Fox Center. I reached out to Dr. Jeff Goldberg, who at the time was at um, Baskin Palmer, and Dr. Larry Benowitz, who was at the time was at Harvard. Uh, Jeff has since moved on to become chair of ophthalmology at Stanford, but Larry's still stuck at Harvard, so we'll give him our condolences. But we came up with the idea of the whole eye transplant. And after a lot of thought, a lot of research, and a lot of grinding of teeth and what have you, we realized that the surgeons can certainly implant or remove an eyeball. And they can certainly uh, hook up the musculature and the vasculature. But what they couldn't do is hook up the optic nerve, connect the optic nerve from the donor to the donee. So it's almost like putting together, building a new car, but not having a motor. And with, the, with Dr. Sahel joining us, and his dedication and thrust in saying optic nerve is where our focus must be, it was perfect. And with Jose's view and Jeff's view and the whole team's view and my particular view is collaboration. Since Jose has joined us, uh, the University of Pittsburgh has formed a partnership with the Sorbonne University and the Fox Center and our Department of Ophthalmology <clears throat> has formed a partnership with the Sorbonne Hospital, and more importantly, or equally important certainly, is the partnership with La Institut de la Vision. And we continue to believe in collaboration. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, most recently, I think through uh, Dave Calkin's introduction at Vanderbilt, our wonderful partnership now with the Glaucoma Foundation. So this is something we believe in, and I encourage all of you who are on the phone, to, on the call today, to reach out to the Fox Center, reach out to Jose and reach out to Jeff. We like collaboration. The last leg of the stool is perhaps the most difficult leg and that's funding. Uh, we all know the, the tragedy of medicine or medical research today, in my opinion, is its dependence on funding. And we all know that whether it be our federal government or our state governments, they're either unable or unwilling to devote the resources necessary to research. So that burden then falls on people like perhaps myself and some of those of you who are listening today and corporate philanthropy. Without it, we can't move forward. So I encourage you all, those of you who have the ability and means, please keep and put medical research on your queue of donations. And if at all possible, it would be nice if you put the Fox Center on the top of your queue. And with that, let me say, uh, I, as a patient, I suffer from a bilateral central ret retinal vein occlusions, as well as uh, unfortunately glaucoma due to a steroidal implant. And this was before the days of Avastin. And I could only say as I did 10 years ago, 
and say it again today. I am an I am still a patient, and as Jeff Gross said, I'm a very impatient patient. But I have such complete confidence in the team of the Fox Center and the people that are on this call today with the collaborations that we've made and will make that we that you will all come up with a fix for this devastating ailment, disease, trauma to the retina nerve. Thank you. Well, Lewis, let me first start by thanking you. That was fantastic. It was certainly, as I know you, very, uh, very impassioned. Um, we obviously have, we have a lot of people on our, our call today, and I want to thank everybody who's joining us. We now have a lot of questions, and I'd like to get to those. So please, uh, our panelists, if you can go ahead and um, mute yourselves and get ready, we'll, we'll ask these questions. And please, Mr. Fox, you stay unmuted as well. Um, so the first one, uh, the question is, does electrical stimulation have any value in restoring the optic nerve? Uh, well, so there have been some studies on optic nerve stimulation, electrical stimulation, especially led by uh, Bernard Sable in Berlin. And uh, there is some indication that it could help. Actually, there are interesting studies also conducted by uh, Dr. Uberman showing that uh, stimulation, like uh, light stimulation, could help. So uh, the problem is that uh, a very careful study has still to be done. Actually, we initiated a collaboration with Bernard Sable. I think uh, also Jeff Goldberg in Stanford and uh, Joel Schumann in New York are willing to be part of that to do a study to really make sure that this is really helpful or not, because currently it's only indication that it could be useful. So we, we should be very careful about uh, non-validated approaches. So it's promising, but has to be fully validated under a protocol and the trial which is going to start very soon. So how close is extracellular matrix to being widely used for optic nerve re, uh, damage or repair? So I can take that one. They, um, <clears throat> you know, there, there are forms of extracellular matrix that are used in the eye. For example, there's amniotic membranes that are applied to corneal ulcers, uh, but there's nothing of which I'm aware of that's presently being used behind the cornea. At studies like we, we've shown you today are, are the, the precursors of that. And one of the, there's two parts of it. One's the science, validate that the science works. But secondly, there needs to be the uh, partnership with industry to manufacture the form of matrix, whether it be a matrix bound nanovesicle, a hydrogel or whatever, that would be, be able to pass regulatory approval and, um, and, and then become for, for, uh, available for clinical translation. And I'm happy to say that there are now uh, uh, several companies that are are well advanced in the commercial commercialization of these various forms of extracellular matrix. Um, there's not, uh, you know, there, as, as Lewis was alluding to, there's um, a lot going on in other parts of regenerative medicine and what we need to do is focus on the eye right now. So short answer to your question is, if, if someone was focused on this particular problem alone, I would estimate something like four years. Um, if it doesn't, if there's not a focus on it, then it's going to probably be longer. Thank you. I think there's a lot of people with that specific question. Is there a window in which patients who uh, need to be treated to receive this type of benefit, you know, I guess when treatments are available, um, is there a window if the vision's lost, say in one or two or three years due to sarcoidosis or other types of vision loss, that would be, uh, that would be important. Is that, is that for me? Uh, uh, Lonnie, I think I think it is. Um, <laughs> yeah. So because the you know the pharma, pharmacologic approach to, just to validate a question, the um, that's a that's an excellent question. And when we got these results, and I'll tell you, the results I showed you was one of the few times in the past ten years where I looked and I got the results. I said, "Wow, you know, it <laughs> it was so dramatic." Uh, so we are now addressing that very question: How long after injury can we um, administer? these matrix-bound nanovesicles and get the same type of results. And I can tell you now that it, it is it not limited to one hour or, or, or 12 hours. It can go longer because obviously one of the clinical applications is glaucoma. Um, so uh, we haven't answered the question definitively yet. We've, we still have work to do on what's the appropriate dose, how frequently do we give it, but it, it is not necessary to be given at the time of injury, which is a, which is a a good thing. Okay. All right. Any, okay. Thank you. Um, what is the status of uh, 
ogliodendrocytes, uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, do rejuvenate the myelin as well. Yeah, the, uh, the, in the studies that we showed, uh, there was a presence of the myelin sheath on, on the axons, the nerve that was there, but we did, have not isolated the oligodendrocytes specifically and studied them. We're busy with the other parts of it. So anybody that wants to come study in a lab and work on oligodendrocytes, send me a note. Okay, and I, and I think we, we're getting a lot of similar questions related to how long a time it would be to uh, regenerate the optic nerve. And thank you, Dr. Ballard, for answering that. We're hopeful that for people who have lost their uh, vision over a number of years still would potentially benefit. It sounds like that's, that's, that's possible. Um, would it be possible to regenerate optic nerve after optic neuritis? Well, uh, so this is an important question. Actually, it does relate to the oligodendrocytes because one of the issues in optic neuritis is really the myelin sheet that can be degenerated. So uh, clearly, uh, you have to tackle not only the fibers, the ganglion cells, but also to tackle the myelin. Maybe Taka could say a comment on that. I think this is a very important area. There is promise. Actually, just next week, I have a very important call on a drug that may help in this respect that we want to try. Uh, so this is a very uh, active area of investigation. Maybe Taka, you may want to comment on that? Uh, so um, I don't have expertise, but just, you know, myelination, you know, myelin, you know, also oligodendral side, and then those non-neural cells, you know, are really important for visual functions. But after injury or maybe just disease, you know, somehow, you know, those you know, non-neural cells or some around their axons, it's bad for axons. But, uh, you know, um, you know uh, Dr. Sahel, you know, said that like, um, so that's, you know, optic nerve is, I think it's fine, but just like myelination or those others affected in that disease. So that's why maybe we have to think about other like uh, strategies or, you know, uh, like method for that kind of, you know, disease. But maybe after injury, after trauma or in glaucoma, so we have focused on more optic nerve regeneration or maintenance. So that's why we have to think about, you know, different kind of method or ways to maintain the optic nerve for visual functions as well. Well, actually, from inflammation is an important component of that, and uh, I know that uh, Kun Chen is working on that. So I think it's important not only to try to regenerate myelin, but to make sure that you control inflammation. And the earliest, I've seen several questions on that, the earliest you do that, the better it is for any outcome. So maybe Kun Chen, you may want to comment on the inflammatory part. Yeah, I think there's a balance between the microglia and the exercise, so which they could play a different role. So like let my current uh, lab members uh, colleague in the lab working on the exercise, showing a very interesting data, like exercise actually played a totally different role as the microglia. So an exercise also play a very important role for scalation or like a little dangerous side, uh, regeneration. So I think we need to look at a both angle for uh, microglia and exercise at the same time, not just only for inflammation, but also like a scalation or gliolysis in the nerve. Yeah. All right. I, I'm, I have to read this because it's very nice. One, uh, he want, someone who wanted to thank us for holding this webinar. And of course, we're welcome to do that. Uh, you're welcome that we've done that. Uh, patient of Dr. Connors and uh, also a nice compliment for Dr. Connor is a wonderful and calming doctor. Uh, but similar to Mr. Fox, David's interested in knowing a timeline for the optic nerve regeneration, mm -hmm. which I think we've sort of answered, but also accepted uh, patient trials and FDA approval. And lastly, uh, Mr. Fox, he says, thank you, Mr. Fox, for your contribution, both personal and monetary, uh, related to David's question. Um, well, I think Jan Connor is a, so we have a magnificent team in Glaucoma, which is led by Jan Connor, and uh, he's not only a very competent, but also an excellent person and patient to love him. So, and as we say, uh, you, you have to treat Glaucoma early. This is very important. In terms of uh, trials, there are already a couple of trials that are about to start, and uh, this is something that we are part of. But as uh, Luis uh, stated, this is a long path. I mean, this is a very complex area of research. You have to be controlling inflammation. You have to be controlling regrowth. So this is not something that we can commit to have a full solution within just two years. It's going to take us several years of work, very intense work. And as Steve Badilak said, if you are focused, it will be faster. If you are diluted, we have fought with many uh, 
approaches that are not very in-depth, then it will take longer. So what we are trying to do with the focus we gave to the Fox Center is really to have a focused approach to this, uh, to this condition to make sure to accelerate path. And the Fox Center is a research entity, but it's fully connected. The approach we have in the department is what we call task forces. We have clinicians and scientists are working together so that any innovation can be brought to patients in an accelerated path. We want to abolish the the bottlenecks and or what can make the silo approaches that really preventing research to being uh, delivered to patients. But it takes the time to do things carefully, in depth, properly, so that we don't damage any remaining vision and we don't compromise the future. But there are several trials that are ongoing or upcoming that uh, we are uh, part of. Well, it, uh, and this is um, maybe a slightly different question, but uh, does uh, where the optic nerve is damaged or length of time of damage affect the possibility of reconnecting? Yeah, well, the earlier, the better. I mean, uh, because uh, clearly uh, when the cells, less cells are remaining, the chances of regeneration are less. But also the more glial, the more fibrotic and uh, scar is occurring, the more difficult it is to overcome that. So the earlier is the better. But what you have seen from Steve Valdilac is that even at uh, advanced stages, you can have some uh, way to remodel actually this pattern and uh, the aspect of a research that is being conducted by Taka, by Kunche, is really how to reduce the scarring and reopening the window for regrowth of the optic nerve and we are learning a lot of that from other species not just in humans maybe Jeff you may want to say a few words about what we are learning from other species how they are able actually to regenerate even in advanced degeneration. Yeah, so there's a, a fascinating literature out there and we work on this in my laboratory so there are different types of organisms that are have tremendous ability to regenerate and in part they do that zebra by fish. controlling just zebra these fish. yeah we work with zebrafish yeah so uh, they can control this infl inflammation and the inflammatory responses and sort of uh, prevent the formation of scar tissue and stimulate these pro regenerative responses so these are the types of things that quinta and and taka are looking at it in the optic nerve and we have others, Debashish Sinha looking at it in the retina, right? If we can start to control some of these inflammatory processes, we might be able to create a pro-regenerative environment. And animals have evolved ways to do this. We've sort of lost that. So we have to figure out how to reactivate those pathways. Thank you. So uh, Louis, you want to know, people want to know if they can be a patient at the Fox Center. Well, the Fox Center course is focused on research um, to bring new therapies to patients. So if you're a patient, uh, happen to be a patient at the, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in Pittsburgh, of course, you'll be the first possibly to benefit from work coming out of here. But this work is for everybody in the world. And that's the, that's the ultimate goal. Um, and uh, kind of moving down here, is, is optic nerve death inevitable with glaucoma? Can the condition be treated and mm -hmm. the damage be avoided? Yes, it can. I mean, uh, the opti the, uh, so I, the pressure is the risk factor. There are a few others, but this is the main uh, risk factor. So if the intraocular pressure is properly controlled, and we heard a lot of uh, comments about Dr. Connor and the team in glaucoma, if you, if you treat glaucoma early, and if you treat, you treat it co with consistency with a very everyday therapy, then you can avoid, in most of the cases, damage to the optic nerve. But this has to be done early and consistently. Uh, so very well therapies, there is a lot of hope of glaucoma as long as the therapies are being appropriately delivered. And obviously many new therapies are being developed here and are in other places on that. So yes, but the issue is we are talking about the situation where this is a bit late, people were not diagnosed early or the management has not been ideal. So how do we make sure that people are keeping what they have, how to protect the remaining cells in the optic nerve and how potentially to regenerate some of them? Okay. Um, all right. I, I see that we do have a few uh, questions that you, that, you know, we didn't get to. Um, I've tried to answer all those and there's some that are sort of repeated. We also have a few that I think maybe would be a bit easier for us to answer offline. Um, so listen, thank you all of these panelists. This was really a, a really outstanding program. And, and, you know, obviously I've been hosting all of them, but but this one was really very fun. And, and I, I can say that it was really nice to have, um, uh, you know, six people who coordinated very well, but also, you know, Lewis, that was, that was, uh, you know, you always are surprising in many ways, but that was also very touching. And it was nice to hear um, your, your, uh, your passion 
so eloquently uh, delivered. So uh, any, any parting words, Lewis, I'll leave it to you as we're about to close the program. No, just thank you uh, to everybody that's on the panel and the team and uh, to all the people that have uh, signed up for the program. Uh, the key is get involved, stay involved so that we can come up with a fix for this problem. Okay. With that uh, parting note, uh, we'll end today's program uh, just at the hour. So thank you, uh, everybody. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, some, and look for invitations. We'll look for a survey tomorrow to give your feedback on some things that, uh, that you'd like to see, maybe other programs you'd like to see. We also like to know um, how we did, so please be honest. And then uh, we'll have uh, in two weeks another program. It'll be focused on our otolaryngology department and work going on there. But you know, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue this going. And uh, for any of those of you maybe wondering whether or not this is just something that's going on during COVID, uh, the plan is no. I we really we're really seeing that this is something that that uh, people appreciate. We want to continue to do uh, indefinitely. Thank you again. Have a day. Have a good day. Thank you.